Hello. Hi, is this Ron? It sure is. How are oh. you doing, Tiffany? I'm good. I'm good. Let me do the official introduction, ladies and gentlemen. We are very excited to welcome our featured guest for this evening. He is an actor of stage and screen and a singer of which you just heard a couple of his songs a few minutes ago. We're very excited to welcome Mr. Ron Thompson to the show. You're on the air with Terry and Tiffany. Welcome, Ron. Hi. Well, we wanted to find out, Ron. This is Terry, a uh, big fan of yours. Uh, in fact, watch Cargo last night. We'll be talking about that. But how are you doing and how are you surviving the uh, zombie apocalypse? <laughs> <laughs> I think I'll survive. <laughs> it really is a crazy world. I mean, you turn around and you see the news, and, and you had even said yourself, you had even said yourself. You I said it, it's a crazy thing because the, the news and everything that's going on, you had even said yourself that with the way the streets are so empty, it kind of reminds you of the days back in the 60s when John Kennedy was assassinated. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, the most important question, though, Ron, is do you have a back stock of toilet paper? I'm, hold on a second. I, uh, oh, we might have a bad on. connection. Okay. Say it again. I said the most important question, Ron, is do you have a back stock of toilet paper? Yeah, I'm not. Uh, uh, for some reason, I wasn't hearing you that well. One more time. I'm sorry. That's okay. That's okay. I said the most important question, though, uh, that we start with is, do you have a backstock of toilet paper? <laughs> <laughs> I've been, uh, luckily, I'm okay at the moment, <laughs> but I have been to two different grocery stores, and they are completely wiped out. I don't, yeah. I don't know. People are nuts. I don't understand it. Yeah. And, and the question is, I, I really haven't heard that the coronavirus gives you the diarrhea, so I really don't know what they plan on doing with all that toilet paper. <laughs> maybe they're I don't gonna, know. Maybe they're going to make know. you know surgical mask out of it or something. I don't know. It, it's crazy. But uh, we want to start out by talking, uh, because we just got done playing your two records that you put out, which is very surprising. I well, didn't know you were a singer. Yeah, well, that was a long time ago. Yeah, you you played them on your sto on your show. Yeah, we we, just we did, them. and of course everybody's playing your records all over the country. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it, it really is surprising they weren't a hit. I mean, uh, how did you get into doing those songs, and and did you really think that that was the direction you were going to be taking, and kind of what was the genesis of the two songs we just heard? Well, uh, I uh, came, to, I left home at nineteen with two hundred dollars. <laughs> And uh, this is a long time ago, and two hundred dollars was maybe two thousand dollars today, maybe. Yeah, right. But yeah, and uh, I I wanted I came there to be an actor. I had I was able to sing. I knew I could sing, but I really wasn't into being a singer. Uh -huh. But uh, I wanted to be an actor, and uh, two during the two years time I did. I met a guy who had had a hit record. His name was Ursel Hickey. I don't know what he ever heard of Ursel, but he had a record in the in the late fifties called "Bluebirds Over the Mountain." Yes, I'm and, familiar uh, with that. Yeah, I know that. Yeah, well, and he he befriended me. He was a few years older than me, and he befriended me. And he he thought I was a kind of a good looking young kid, and uh, he thought that he should. I should try to be a singer. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he introduced me to a lot of different people, and I finally met some people that wanted to record me. And and at the very same time that I was doing that, I got an agent for acting, and I did. I got my first acting role on TV, on live. It, this was back in 1962 okay. when it was li live television, not tape. Mm -hmm. You did it, and that was it, man. And uh, I got a, a really good part on a TV show called Armstrong Circle Theater. And at the same day that, that that show went on the air, my first record, if by chance, was released. <laughs> Is that oh. weird? That's but strange. The, yeah, but I had two different records that came out, and neither one of them uh, were hits. Uh, 
and my acting career started to happen a little bit, which which I was really more interested in, and I was disenchanted with the uh, music business, so I just didn't pursue it after a while. Well, it's kind of strange the way things went full circle, because I was reading in a notes here that uh, when you portrayed the two characters you portrayed in, in American Pop, we'll go into that whole thing later about the rotoscoping and everything, there was actually a move you did as one of your characters that you got from Urzel Hickey, right? Yeah, uh, American Pop was very close to me. You know, there was there, there's there's a lot of things about American Pop that was me, uh, really. You know, uh, uh, I left home at 19, so did Tony, and uh, I be I, I had a little bit of a career as a as a rock singer. The as a matter of fact, the the scene in American Pop where I'm on the bus and I write my first song mm-hmm. uh, on the bus, and the way I wrote it was the way Ursula Hickey taught me how to write songs. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so mm-hmm. there's a whole a whole lot of things that I got just in that movie that uh, was really me. So as far as the uh, records we heard, I want to find out just a little bit more about that. Uh, did, did they get like airplay at all? I mean, was was it a major label or really kind of like where did that come from there? Uh, not really. No. The, 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 if by if by chance uh, was a kind of a small label and uh, mm-hmm. and I was in New York. I heard that they did play it some in uh, out here in L.A., but they didn't play it in uh, in New York. I, I don't know what was going on. The other one. Uh, that you didn't really have you. You heard, you heard uh, 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 Brown Eye Evil Eye. Right. That's what you heard. Right. 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 That's from a movie that I did. Oh. Okay. But uh, yeah, I had another record through a a, a better uh, recording company called right. Joy Records, but uh, it, that didn't happen either. The the one you heard Brown Eye Evil Eye that was. What happened was because of the, my my uh, record uh, fledging record career and my acting career, I got an audition for a lead in a movie that was shot in in Yugoslavia when it was Yugoslavia, not uh, what it is now. Right. Uh, and uh, I and I got the part. I played a I played a singer. I, I sang three songs in it, and Brown Eye Evil Eye was the title song. And I starred with uh, uh, the British actor, do you remember Hugh Griffith? Oh, absolutely, yes. Yeah, I starred with him. And uh, the movie didn't, it was a, I had a lot of starts and stops to my career right. at, at first, and that movie didn't happen. Uh, the, the music was pretty good, and I really like that Brown Eye Evil Eye. I think it's kind of a kind of a James Bondy kind of a sound to it. I, I liked it, but right. um, yeah. Um, well, one of the interesting uh, things about your career, though, Ron, is that when you really kind of got your acting kind of got a shot in the arm was when you actually originated a, a role on stage, right? Tell us a little bit about uh, yeah. the role of Shanty. Yeah. Well, that happened... Uh, I, I it, it, Through a succession of events, I met Charles Gordon, who wrote this play, No Place to Be Somebody. Won, it won the purest surprise. He was a, he was a black man who was the first black uh, writer to win the Pulitzer Prize for playwriting. Mm -hmm. And I had actually met him uh, back in 62. And we, uh, and then he talked about this play and then in 67 he had it and we did readings in his apartment and then 69 we finally got a production of it at the Joe Papp's uh, Public Theater, and the play got unanimous critical acclaim. And uh, it won the Drama Critics Award, the Theater World Award, the Obie Award. Uh, it starred, uh, I had a, have a really good part of, uh, of Shanty. 
the, the play is about um, a, a black man in the early 60s who owned a, a saloon in the village, in Greenwich Village, and it's played by one of the most the most brilliant actor I ever worked with. His name is Nathan George. Mm -hmm. Nathan, I don't know whether you... He he did a few movies, but he but you never really saw his real brilliance. He was he was in uh, one of the movies he did was the Pel the, the first Pelham Park, taking a Pelham Park mm -hmm. something. Yeah, he played the uh, the um, transit cop in that. But he did a lot of different things. But he's a brilliant brilliant actor. He, he died a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, it also starred uh, a fellow named Ron O'Neill. Oh, yes. Ron o Superfly. Yes. <laughs> the man. And he, yeah. And me. <laughs> uh, my role, Shanty, uh, w was the bartender in this bar. And Shanty was kind of uh, a little off. <laughs> and uh, he had delusions of grandeur that he was this great jazz drummer and one day he's going to get himself a boss set of skins and quit you flat go for that and and I get a I have a girlfriend a, a uh, uh, practical nurse played brilliantly by Marge Elliott mm -hmm. and uh, she came up with the money for me to buy this set of drums. And she brings me into the bar. <laughs> and, I, and Nathan and and Ron O'Neill and they all sit down and watch me. I'm awful. <laughs> I'm just awful. <laughs> but I think I'm what I think I'm really great. And uh and it's it's a it's 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 a funny scene and it's a it's it's a sad scene and it's kind of frightening because I go off on the on my uh, girlfriend and it's it's a pretty powerful scene and the whole play the play is a brilliant play. It almost it's, sounds like uh, something that could have been a scenario for one of the uh, scenes in American Pop, doesn't it? What about American Pop? Say it again. I'm saying it almost sounds it's uh, like a scenario that could have been an American Pop. Yeah. Interestingly enough, Charles Gordon, the writer, was in one of Ralph Bakshi's movies. Oh, okay. Uh, he, he he was in uh, 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 the one that what was the one that was based on uh, Song of the South. Um, Coonskin? What? Was it Coonskin? Yeah, yeah. He he played uh, uh, the. Oh, my mind. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's but, okay. We I, a lot of my people out there they they know the film for sure. But wow, that's that's very interesting. It seems like your your career kind of overlaps in a lot of ways. You know. Oh but, yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's almost like it's meant to be. Yeah, it it really it really did. It uh, uh, after after no place, then uh, I traveled around the country doing it, and then I came, ended up in Hollywood, and I did a play called Does the Tiger Wear a Necktie? Now that I one, won. that one, you actually won an award for, right? I sure did. I sure did. Uh, uh, Al Pacino had done it in New York and he won the Tony mm -hmm. and I did it out here and I won the Drama Critic Circle Award nice. and and then my then my TV and film career started to happen uh, at that point and, and the next 10 years or so I started doing a, a lot of television and uh, uh, a few films and I did American Pop I did that during that period of time and uh, I was uh, a semi-regular on Beretta, and I, you know, it was a it was a good time. Now I was exactly at this moment because you kind of read my mind. Going to mention Beretta because one of my favorite actors, and of course he got involved in a little controversy later on, uh, was Robert Blake, and it started out actually as one of the little rascals, and wound up in Beretta, yeah. and, and he was uh, 
in, in some of the old serials and stuff. Uh, Red Rider, I believe it was, and, and, and he played a little Indian yeah. boy. Uh, but your acting, a lot of ways, reminds me of Robert Blake's acting. Uh, what was well, it like working? You. Oh, sure. What was it like working with Robert Blake? Uh, was he like a, a nice guy, or you know, a lot of people always he, kind of said he was a hothead. He's he's mad as a catter, <laughs> but, <laughs> but he was always good to me. Mm-hmm. He always uh, I I actually how I got the part I I got a, a role on there as a as a homeless junkie. There's character named penguin right. it's a ni- really nice role and i did the part and uh segue i i was i don't know if you know who you remember who strutter martin is oh absolutely yes, yes one of my favorite character yeah. actors for sure yeah well strutter was a good friend of mine we did oh, a okay. play together and and we he was a good friend of mine and he's he was also a friend of robert blake oh and, and I had told Strother that I was doing this sh- doing the show and all and what I was doing. And the next week, Strother and and Robert went out fishing. And and Strother t- said a friend of mine did your show and he, he asked him what it was and he told him he played the junkie. He said, "Oh, that was your friend. He's really good." Uh, and uh, the next next day. It's so just an example of who you know, because I mean I I, I did a great job in the mm. part, but it's who you know. Oh, that's true. And, for sure. uh, and uh, I get a call from Universal to come. That, that Robert Blake wants to talk to me, and I meet him, and he tells me that he's been thinking about having this a uh, young cop on the show to be like a like his uh, sidekick, mm. and he said we'll try you out. And we, start next week wow. <laughs> and I, and I started out the first week I wasn't even in the script <laughs> we just kind of <laughs> had lived to stuff and then the next week they wrote they wrote my parts and all and I did, I did about seven or eight shows of, of that and uh, it kind of uh, I had a problem with my agents and and, and it just it was something kind of fizzled out mm-hmm. but well, he was always very supportive to me. Uh, uh, he was. Uh, uh, he was. A, I remember one time he 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 had a, an argument with uh, the. Oh, uh, they're having. The police are going by my house. No. <laughs> uh, he he had a uh, he had a fight with with uh, the the networks or something, mm-hmm. and and we're getting ready to do a do a scene and suddenly he just starts this rant and it wasn't a, wasn't at me it was a, a just for whoever was going to hear it everybody had to stop <laughs> and listen to this rant sounds like Bob and it's just, it just before we're supposed to do a scene and I'm having to shh, just listen to this <laughs> and, try, and try to be cool you know and not and then when he finished he looked at me and he looked at me he was really sorry that he had to do it in front of me, you know. Right. But uh, he was okay. I, his 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 deal with the murder of his wife and all that stuff. I I haven't seen him since 1978, maybe. Okay. I guess. Uh, but the, I tell you the truth. As I told you, he he was mad as a hatter. Mm-hmm. But he was extremely honest. Uh, he, he is not the kind of guy that would hot. If they said, did you kill her? He would have said, yeah, she had it coming. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, I was just going to say that because I often uh, that's told the people. Guy, that's the guy that I knew. Yeah. So, <laughs> and if he did kill her, she probably deserved it. I, I really <laughs> probably shouldn't say yeah. that. But. Well, from what I, what I heard, she... She didn't have a lot of friends. Yeah, she, she there was. was a, a, there was a really good uh, 2020 that was on uh, about a year ago. Uh-huh. I don't know what you saw. Did you see it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. She yeah, she kind of was and, a bit of a pretty, slut. It, yeah, it pretty much exonerated him. Really, yeah. I felt. Yeah. You know, but America. I don't know. America is very uh, uh, judgmental, and that's for sure. We're, 
once you've been arrested, you're you're guilty. That's yeah. all. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Now, well, yeah. you're you're good because you you were friends with Robert Blake, so you don't have to worry about it. <laughs> so it's all good. But yeah. yeah. I didn't I didn't kill nobody. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, uh, right around that time, uh, Ron, you kind of had a pattern of working with Hollywood, you know, tough guys and, and people that, you know, again, had reputations of, of being rough and tumble. Now, you went on to do a film called The White Buffalo with Charles Bronson. What was he like? Well, I tell you, we never really, uh, really met. We never... He, I was in a scene in which he was in also, but we didn't have dialogue together. Yeah. And uh, we never really talked or anything. Uh, I remember there was a uh, there was a, a, a bunch of chairs in a circle that was there for the cast, and I'm sitting on one end of the circle, and he came and he sat on the other end of the circle. He was my might have been 20, 30 feet away from me. And we didn't say a word to each other. <laughs> <laughs> he's very imposing. I mean, he's gone now, of course, but I don't think I'd have wanted to pick a fight with him. I think I probably would have fought Robert Blake before I fought <laughs> Charles Johnson. You know, seriously, just very scary man. Uh, I've yeah, got to ask I you that. We, we done mentioned... I was just happy to be there, and I didn't want to make any waves. Right, right. <laughs> we already mentioned Beretta, and I don't want to talk too much on that, but I've got to ask you, did you ever, and this sounds crazy, but this is me, did you ever have a chance to do a scene with uh, Fred the Cockatoo? <laughs> no, he was never in my in, in any of the shows, but I, but I, but I did meet him. Okay. Uh, uh, interesting enough, the, uh, an agent that I had when I first started the job, father was the trainer for the cockatoo. Yeah. And he came on the set one day. I guess he was he was in another scene, but I wasn't in that scene. And he introduced me, and and Fred was there. Everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Ask me about Fred, but I never worked with Fred. <laughs> I remember Robert Blake used to love talking about working with, with Fred, and Fred would bite him once in a while, and Robert Blake just reach over and wrap him in the head because <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't like getting... I actually met Fred, too. I met Fred and his trainer, and, and Fred was nice, except he was a little conceited. But very, very entertaining bird. You know, you've worked with so many great people. There's, there's somebody else you worked with, and he was a guest on our show. And we love him so much, William Cat, because you were in the Greatest American Hero. Oh yeah, on uh, uh, yeah, Greatest American Hero, yeah, that was uh, we. That was another situation where we actually never worked together because my scene with him, he was invisible. Right. So he wasn't on the, in the scene at all. <laughs> I. I, I I, uh, it's a, it was a show, uh, Keenan, Keenan Wynn. Keen yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he had seen The Greatest American Hero, I guess, and he told people and they thought he was nuts. And they, they ended up putting, putting him in a, in a crazy ward. Mm. And I was, uh, I was a, a, a deputy sheriff. Mm hmm who was a real asshole and I was giving him a hard time mm -hmm. and uh, the greatest American hero came and talked to him and said and, and it was talking to him and I was at the door and he said don't worry I got this covered and he get, becomes invisible and I come in and he starts messing with me and he throws me against the wall and uh, and then he depends me <laughs> and, and, <laughs> And I'm and I'm just like completely nuts, and I escape from the, from from the place. You know that so, that might have actually been good training for something I saw last night. Now, you recently did five movies which were unreleased, and luckily one of them got released, and it's a movie by the name of Cargo. Now, I saw Cargo yeah. last night. Now, Cargo is a very unique film. I've never seen anything like it in the fact that it's a full length movie has a story, everything to it, but you're the only actor that's ever seen on screen. 
Yeah. I, I thank you for watching it. I appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, that was, this might be an interesting story as to how all this happened. After, like in the, at the end of the 90s, my acting career had just kind of not, it was just nothing. I wasn't going out on anything of importance and, and it was just like really dead. And I went through a divorce and I was in extreme depression and I just stopped acting. I stopped it. I didn't have an agent and I didn't try to get a, get a job. I took, I, I took uh, low paying jobs, whatever I could get just to keep me from being homeless. And this went on for about 10, 15 years. It was a really hard time right. in my life. Yeah. And, and and I worked through a lot of the depression uh, 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 and, and a friend of mine uh, came up with good boy. Boy, it, it looks like you're having some fun wherever you live. <laughs> yeah, I know. May, maybe they're out uh, after toilet paper bandits or something. I don't know. I'm in Van, I'm in Van Nuys. Oh. It's, a, it's a busy place. But a friend of mine gave me a, a, a computer. I mean, I had no money. Okay. I, I had no computer. Or not, but another friend taught me how to get on Facebook. And, I, and, and Craig... Within a week's time that I got on Facebook, people from all over the world contacted me. Unbeknownst to me, American pop had become a cult classic. And I, had n I didn't know this because I didn't have a computer. Right. I, didn't, I didn't know any of this. And because of, uh, of uh, at that time, there was a, there was, like HBO, there was a Cinemax that played it all the time. All the time. And uh, the internet and, and Facebook. And it had become a cult class. And they had released finally the, the DVDs. And I didn't know any of this. And besides that, the, the, the fans that I got were, were, all, were a lot of young people who understood what rotoscoping was. Mm -hmm. And they understood that it wasn't just a voiceover, that it was a tracing of a performance. Right. And they knew, who, they knew who I was, they knew I played Tony and Pete, and they contacted, and they said, we've been looking for you for years. And, and two, um, two of those people were young filmmakers. One I thought so. Joe, one was Joe Black, who you mentioned that I'd done about five movies for that uh -huh. really good films that haven't been released yet, but they will be. And the other was James Dillon, who wrote Cargo. And uh, that's how all this happened. Now, Cargo is very unique in, in the fact that what the plot is, is you're, and we find out later on in the movie, you're unscrupulous. You're kind of an asshole, as you've talked what do you about. Mean? Well, you, you're, <laughs> what do you mean unscrupulous? You know, I, I started out thinking that you were a nice guy, and I was feeling sorry for you. Then you turned, <laughs> you turned out to be this major prick. <laughs> and, 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 you know, I was glad that you were trapped in a cargo, okay? Because you, what you basically are is, is you're a rich, kind of a dick, kind of type businessman. And, and uh, these people wind up kidnapping you and hold you at bay in a cargo container, which is, we find out later, uh, at the L.A. Pier down there. But you're in this cargo uh, holder, which is a big aluminum or, or box. box steel, whatever. And you have nothing but a cell phone. And you're told that you have to raise $10 million within so uh, amount of time, or you and your trophy wife, as you talk about, will be killed. Yeah. Now, yeah. It, it was unique in the fact, and, and this is what I really want to touch on, is while there is other actors and other acting going on, everything that you interact with with everybody else is over the phone, because all we see through the whole movie is you in this cargo container. And I... And in reality, I wasn't talking to these actors. I had a feeling. <laughs> wow. I was, I was talking to a uh, 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 a young girl who was who was like the uh, what do they call them? They, they help the 
PA production assistant or yeah yeah, yeah. She, she's a PA mm-hmm. she's a PA she couldn't act but a sweet girl and that's who I was she would call me up and that's who I was doing I was acting with and and when I finished shooting all my stuff then James brought in all the voiceover actors and they did it with him now it, it was so <laughs> unique if you think about it. okay we play a lot of old time radio shows and I imagine maybe you might have heard a few old time radio shows in your time you're around my age and, and it was unique in the fact to where all we see is you in in the darkened uh, cargo uh, holding uh, unit and you're sitting there with your phone but you're acting with all these other actors and you have to visualize in your mind what's going on because you know they in graphically uh, detailed form you know tell what's going on and there's car chases and things that get involved but you have to envision all this in your mind it really was kind of like old time radio what was that like for you as an actor to have to work like that well I I was prepared <laughs> and and uh, I worked on this and, and we shot it we shot it in the car in an actual cargo container wow and and uh, uh, we did it in eight. I shot it in eight days. We did it all uh, 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 in uh, succession of the mm-hmm. script. Mm-hmm. We didn't have to since it was all uh, done just me and the cargo. We didn't have to shoot, you know, and with movies you might shoot the last scene first right. and the right. first scene and all. But you didn't have. But we did it all straight through, and it had to be so, had to be rough. Because man, you were on screen through the whole thing. Yeah, it was. It was the time. There was a couple of times that I was kind of exhausted, <laughs> but for the most part, it was so it was so invigorating and so creative that you know I just I was I was having a ball. I really was. Well, hopefully, it wasn't uh, in the summer because it would have had to have been hot as hell in there. It was, when was it? It was, uh, no, it was like uh, around December, I think, something yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, the cargo container was parked in the driveway of the uh, cinematographer who had just bought a new house. Uh-huh. And it was, it was empty. So I lived in the house the whole time. Uh, he, he made gave me a little uh, little a blow up bed, I mm-hmm. guess. And, <laughs> and I slept on the floor and I ate there, and uh, and then I went right outside and got into the, into this cargo container, which was right out in front of the house. Well, I, I thought and, of two things when I saw it. First of all, it had to be uh, a dream for a filmmaker, as, as far as you know, the uh, perfect example of a movie didn't you know didn't necessarily take a big budget because you know there's just that one set but for you as an actor to to have to carry the whole thing like that that had to be like an actor's dream it really did yeah yeah it, it was it was it was really exciting and uh well you know james was a big fan of mine and he uh him and uh his uh producer j jc Masick, they were both big fans of of uh of mine from uh American pop, and they he wrote the thing for me. And uh, as a matter of fact, J.C. Masick is a writer, and after we made the movie, he wrote a novel on cargo uh, on the on the whole movie. He wrote a mm-hmm. novel, on, and uh, that's been that's been published and out. Uh, but uh, yeah, they they believed in me, and and. and that was nice, you know. There's so, so him and and my friend Joe Black that I did the other film. They really built my confidence back up because I had lost all confidence in myself. Now, unfortunately, the reason you lost confidence, part partly to blame, uh, was was because of one of the greatest cult films of all time, which is American Pop, because at the time they offered you something that was very unique. And we'll all go into how that was done and rotoscoping and everything. But you really thought you were going to become like this big international star because of that. But nobody really knew that was you that played those two characters, right? Right. That was the. It was. It was. I, I had been told by Ralph and that uh, everybody would know this, but that's not the case at all. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, when the movie came out, 
Colombia, first of all, the the main producer, Marty uh, Ranselhoff, he changed, he made sure that the, the, the back end, the first, the, the, the credits at the beginning of the picture, Ralph had him, had featuring the performances, which I agreed that was good. Mm-hmm. And, but Marty Ranselhoff changed the uh, credits at the end of the movie to Voices. Oh, so and then and everybody needs to know that that while you were rotoscope, to explain that what that is, it was not your voice. So they gave credit to the character as the person who did the voice. And they didn't mention you then, right? And mm. and Columbia Pictures didn't. This was back, you know, eighty eighty one, uh, and they didn't want anybody even knowing about the rotoscope. They thought that it would cheapen Ralph's animation mm. today. I mean, rotoscope, it's done by computer. Back then it was done with with uh, animators. But right. today, it's rotoscoping is done by animation. Uh, Avatar was rotoscoped. Yes. And, and, and everybody knew it was actors, you know. But they didn't want anybody knowing that at that time. And so I was, my contribution and all the other actors' contribution was, was buried. Mm. And the... And the movie, when the movie was released, a couple other things happened. Uh, you know, it had a lot of music in it. Uh, Jimi Hen- Hendrix and Janet Joplin mm-hmm. and, and Boss Skag, all these. And they advertised all the music and the, and the recording stars. And it, it looked like it was like a MTV movie or something. And uh, opening night at the at Brahmin's Chinese, Craig, Tiffany, they were lined. I don't know. If, are you in California? Yes. Are you in yes. LA? Yeah, yeah, we are. Okay. Yeah. Well, they were lined up from Franklin Avenue wow. all the way down to uh, Hollywood Boulevard. They were these, and they were all young kids wanting to see this MTV movie. <laughs> well, that, And they went and saw it, and they didn't dig it because they, they were not ready to see a, a serious story about the, uh, this family. And the people that would have loved to have seen this movie didn't go because they thought it was just a bunch of noise. And, and then on top of that, the young kids are seeing this movie, and it takes place in an era of the 20s through the 40s, and, and that was old-fashioned yeah. to them, you know. Yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. So uh, so the older people that probably would have enjoyed it didn't go because they didn't advertise it right. That's right. Yeah. And so the movie was a big bomb, and, uh, and uh, I was, like, invisible to it. Yeah. And so, you know, it was like uh, <laughs> when the... Nobody knew my contrib- Nobody knew anything about the rotoscope. If I did mention that I was in it, and they they figured that I was a voice, right? Yeah, it, just a voiceover. Well, can and, you uh, can you tell us a little bit about uh, the audition process and uh, going in because you actually didn't come in to read for Tony or Pete, right? Right. I came in. Uh, I was brought in uh, to read for a, a rather small part. Uh, one of Frankie, uh, uh, the girl, used a uh, small play, Frankie, who uh, was, I call it the Janis Joplin character. Right. Mm-hmm. And, right. And she has this band, and there's like four or five guys in the band, and I'm brought in to, to read for one of these, these guys. They are like two or three lines. And they brought uh, they brought about four or five of us in to read for all the all the roles, and so I I read my lines, and Ralph stopped me. He said, "Who are you?" And I told him who I was. Uh-huh. Oh man, what's going on tonight? Anyway, <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, he said, "I want him to read for Pete," mm. and. <laughs> okay, <laughs> and they give me the scene. Pete only has one actual C 
scene in which he uh, has lines. Mm-hmm. The rest of the time, he's just he's just there being being cool. Right. And so I I go out and I look at the part and I came back in and I said, "Pizza man, we <laughs> deliver." <laughs> and he said, "You got it." Wow. He said, "That's it. That's the guy I want." And uh, uh, so. About uh, uh, three weeks later, we did a, uh, a filming of of some of the scene. Uh, I was nobody really knew, but it was really like a, a screen test. But we u- ended up using stuff that we did. Wow! Uh, well, I actually used the screen and test. I, and I did. And there was a guy, I don't know what his name is, I never, we never really even met, but there was mm-hmm. a guy playing Tony, and, uh, and I did my, I had the scene, uh, this, my, my scene with uh, Pete, where I walked by the, the old Jewish man. Right. Mm-hmm. That's, that was my first, my first stuff, we shot that that day, actually, and, uh, so we did I did that a little bit and then about two weeks later I get a call to come and see Ralph and he says uh, listen um, the guy that's playing Tony he's a good actor but I don't think he really understands what we're doing with, with this do you think that you could play Tony and Pete <laughs> I said, "Hell yeah, I can play. Uh, I can play the girls' part too." I Why said, not? <laughs> I mean, hell, you know, be the Janis Joplin character or the cute little waitress. I fell in love with the waitress. The, the, the whole oh, thing yeah. when they played a Sam Cooke song. But so people understand now. Rotoscoping is a term that I am familiar with because I'm a Max Fleischer fan with the old Betty Boop and Popeye cartoons and stuff. And they used it. And they started using it way back then. But what it actually is 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 you actually acted out every single scene it was filmed in what you call a minimal set because there was rooms that went nowhere and you know just basic props around you but not very detailed not like a full set and and they took all your footage and and ralph and his team drew over top of you and made you animated is that that pretty much how it worked or how would you explain it that you that's that's pretty much it yeah we we shot the entire movie on a sound stage yeah, and and all we had, if 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 I had to go through a door, there was a door, uh-huh. but there was no wall. Okay. <laughs> and and uh, whatever we needed, you know, uh, a, a bench or whatever, but it was very bare, and uh, the and then we we shot that. It was shot in black and white, you know, mm-hmm. because there was no, because they were going to color it later anyway. Right. Right. And and they and they edited that film, and then that film was then twenty four frames per second was blown up into a photograph, and the animators. This is back when they had an, real live animators. Right. Would would take that photograph and trace the actor, and then draw the background in. <laughs> and it it took them it took them about a year to do all of this. I would imagine. Now I was curious though, uh, Ron, when you were brought in to you know audition for the film, you and the other actors, kind of two questions: one, did they explain to you this process so you knew what you were getting into? And two, did Ralph or anybody else ever explain why they didn't have you guys doing the voices and they did it in ADR later? Uh, what, uh, I missed the part, the last part about the voices. Yeah, did, did Ralph or any of the production ever explain why they decided to dub your guys' voices in later? Why didn't they just let the actors do the voices? They didn't dub the voices in. They didn't? So that's your no, voice? They, they didn't dub it in. That was, uh, that was uh, they used exactly what we did. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, that was not dubbed in. As a matter of fact, 
when, back when we did the uh, uh, that first session, Ralph wanted what he wanted. He had us to do a, 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 a before we did that. He brought us into a recording studio and we recorded our, our whole roles. Mm -hmm. I didn't know why we were doing that. And when we went to do this session, he wanted us to pantomime the voice, the, what we had done. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I did mine. I did mine okay. Most people, most of them couldn't do it really very well. And I told him. I, f I felt very comfortable with him right away, and I and I here I, I only knew him for about a few <laughs> mm -hmm. about an hour or so, and I went over to him and I said, "Listen, that ain't gonna work. You know, you're gonna lose something that's really precious by having not having the spontaneity." Uh, he said, "Well, you were able to do it." I said. I'm able to do any fucking thing, you know. <laughs> but, but most of these actors are not going to be able to do this. And you're just going to... And he listened to me, and he scrapped it. Oh. Yeah. Uh, that was a thing. And, and, and all, all through shooting this movie, Ralph and I had a relationship to where uh, if I had an idea for something... I went and told him, and practically every time he said, yeah, let's do that. I mean, uh, like the little boy, uh, Eric, mm -hmm. who played Little Pete. Right. Uh, uh, I saw him, they had uh, combed back his hair, and he, was, he, and he had a leather jacket on, and he was, this was when he was like becoming more of, a, more of the older Pete if you remember. Right. And I looked, I looked at him and I said, wait a minute. And I went and got my, my glasses, uh, my sunglasses, and I put them on him and I said, Ralph, I want to teach him to walk like Pete. He says, okay. And I, and I taught him. And we did the movie and I'm doing Tony so I don't see what he's doing. And, and then when I look at the movie, it blew my mind because he was, he was so frightening, man, to mm -hmm. see him. The way he was walking and all. He was told, he was Pete. And uh, uh, all the way through the movie, I, I would come up with, with ideas and tell Ralph. And he would say, yeah, well, let's do that. Let's do that. And you, you know, know that that's very surprising because I've known people that it's met Ralph. And, and we actually talked to Ralph, too. Uh, Tiffany talked to Ralph because he was going to be on the show one time. But a lot of people have said he's really hard to get along with, that he's a little cantankerous or whatever. And you say just the opposite. No, just the opposite for me. Just the, you know, I had, I had problems with him later on. Okay. After the movie, after the movie was released. Uh, well, you know, and, can, can you tell but, us what happened? What happened? Well, I don't, I don't really want to get into it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, That's you know, fair. He, uh, you know, he, <coughs> Columbia had him by the, by the gonads. He right. had to do what they say. Right. You know, but uh, but as far as working with him, it, 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 I, I love it. I actually worked with him uh, about ten years ago. Actually, uh, he had a a project uh, that he was trying to get off the ground called. Uh, uh, last days of Coney Island, or mm -hmm. something yes, like that. Yes, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, I ended up just like doing some voices for him and things uh, in it. But uh, you know, he, he's he's cool. He's just well. He's that, that, that's that's good. I, everybody's a little nuts, but I mean, <laughs> that, that's good. You, yeah. you call him. You know, we get older and we get a little well, cantankerous too. Somebody said one time. Well, uh, everybody's crazy, but some of us get caught. That's right. Exactly. <laughs> but I, I wanted to touch once again because, you know, we were a little confused with our notes, and you had said earlier uh, that Columbia changed the end titles around to give credit to the voice actors rather than the people that did the rotoscopy. Now, I am right in knowing that not only are you portraying all those characters of the two that you played where they, they drew over you, but that is your voice too, right? 
Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. oh I'm glad to that's, find that out. Oh, yeah, that's, that's me totally. You know, that, that's from the, from the, uh, the black and white movie wow. that we made. That, that, there was no voiceover from that. Yeah. yeah. So be- before we before we move on from American Pop, though, I just I have to ask you about the very famous scene where your character is running across the train. Now, if you're acting all of this out, how did you guys do that scene? <laughs> I was. Uh, uh, he had a, a, I don't know, maybe about a fifteen foot uh, platform, uh, and I got on the platform. Uh, it was like a large table, and I just ran across it like I was on a train, and that was it. Wow. <laughs> and then, the, and then the animator grew under me. <laughs> yeah. Well, you turn around and think about what you had to do with, with American Pop, and uh, I've heard actors tell stories when they're fighting monsters and the monsters are not there and they have to do to a blue screen or whatever. Just what you did in American Pop really kind of gave you training for cargo. Because you're acting yeah, as something that's not there, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Now I understand. Yeah, it, it, it all, you know, like you, you, you said it before. Everything kind of meshed together, really. Yeah. <laughs> you know, right, right. My, whole, my whole career is kind of together as, as, as to what I've been doing. You know. Now, where American Pop was, was not a big hit back then, okay, it is now due to a cult following, and I know you've done other ones of, of Q&As and screenings before, but I understand you've got a new screening coming up. They're going to be screening uh, American Pop, and you're going to be there for the question and answer period. Is that right? Is there anything you can tell us about it? Oh, yeah, that's, that's going to uh, that. It, it's interesting. I found out about that the same, the same night that, I, that Tiffany contacted me. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, the, uh, this is going to be April the 15th at a theater downtown L.A. called The Club. And I don't know too much about it yet, but they're going to be doing a showing of it. it it's, uh, from what I understand, the theater shows a lot of retro movies. Yeah. Right. And, and uh, so I'll be doing Q&A from that. Uh, the first, I, I did one before that, mm-hmm. uh, six years ago, uh, at the uh, Hollywood Egyptian Theater, it was the first time, the first time I was ever introduced to an audience wow. as, the, as the actor that played Tony and Pete. Well, you know, uh, you wind up getting your just desserts in the end, and it's really too bad you didn't get you know any attention back then, but you certainly are now. Uh, I guess, uh, according to the notes that I'm reading here, uh, actor Richard Dreyfus even said he knew that was you because he recognized you kind of from the film. Well, yeah, yeah. Richard and I, Rick, Richard was in a um, a play that I did uh, with another huge star, Henry Fonda. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah, I did a play called The Time of Your Life. Oh, yeah. It was a... Yeah, and uh, we we toured uh, all over the country with it, and uh, that's how I met Strud. Strud was in that, and uh, Richard was a was an unknown actor. He had a part in it, and uh, yeah, that's that's how uh, that happened. <laughs> and then I ran into him uh, a couple of years after Pop came out, and he told me that he was yeah. Yeah. We, you know, I want to ask you, Ron, as we kind of wrap up here, uh, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty. So I know that at the time that everything happened with American Pop, you were a little bit disappointed. And then, you know, you, you kind of went into, as you had mentioned, a depression for a while. You went into a spiritual journey. Now you're getting uh, kind of a resurgence from the fans who know who you are. Knowing all of that, if you could go back, would you change anything? Would you still do American Pop, knowing that you weren't going to really get oh, yeah. the accolades for it? Oh yeah, I would. It would. It would be easier to do it knowing <laughs> knowing the outcome. Right. <laughs> and, and you want to uh, you want to know what irony is? Let me tell you what irony is, Ron. We talk about 
uh, how your life seems to be kind of pre-planned. Here you started out as a rock star and you put out two records right. and they went nowhere and now come to find out you're on an album cover from American Pop because <laughs> your image is part of that movie poster. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so even it's, though it's, you it's didn't amazing, you, isn't it? Yeah, even though you didn't hit big as a pop star, you're on a pop album, you're on a pop <laughs> album cover. So you, you kind of really? wound up being a rock star after all. Yeah. Do you have uh, that movie poster on your wall in your place? You really should. Uh, I got a small one. Yeah. Very cool. It's, it's an 8x10 picture of it. Very cool. I'm looking at it right here. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Oh, there you go. All right, yeah. so uh, we like to wrap up with always letting our listeners know where they can keep in contact and keep updated on our guest. Um, so where online should people go to try to keep updated of things that you're doing, like the upcoming uh, Q&A that you're going to be doing at the club? Yeah, uh, well, I'm, I am on Facebook. Uh, that's for sure. And I'm on Instagram. Instagram... Uh, um, it's Ron Thompson Cargo. Okay. And and I have a a really really good website, uh, a brand new one. Uh, it's only about a month old, and uh, it's I'm really proud of it. Uh, the uh, the link is Ron Thompson Actor dot WordPress dot com and uh it's very I'm nicely really, it's very nicely put together it's beautiful it's a beautiful huh? yeah, site beautiful site yeah oh yeah you saw it good yeah yeah, yeah i'm i'm really happy it's got it's got a more it's got more than you, you need to know about <laughs> <laughs> now, now cargo has been released and you can see that right now on amazon prime uh what about yes. the, the other four films that haven't been released what are they uh, well, uh, the last one I did uh, were for Joe, Joe Black, uh -huh. is called Tellers. It's a really good film noir, and I play a um, uh, an ex-cop who uh, wants to solve his grandson's death, his murder, and it's it's I think it's really a good film. And I did an, and another one for him was uh, called uh, Low Town, and in that one I play a, a gangster, uh, a head of a gang, uh, and uh, the and then there's a very unique uh, western called Hate Horses, and I play uh, a bounty hunter. Mm. And there's another one called Jenna. Jenna, and I have one scene at the end. It's a really strong scene of me in a in a uh, in a Uber with a woman, and I'm drunk. I'm drunk, and mm -hmm. I'm uh, talking about my life, and it's, it's it's a really nice little scene. All these movies are really good. This. The movie business at the moment is very difficult. Oh yeah. There, if it's if it's not starring, you know, Tom Cruise or somebody, if there's not some big blowups, uh, or if it's not a very very definite genre movie, uh, it it's hard to to get get going. Right. Well, thank God for independent pictures, like with the uh, production that yeah. released Cargo. That way we get to see great performances by people like you, uh, because that's who they hire, real actors and independent actors, and, and it gives us a chance to see them. Because, you know, you can't just watch Johnny Depp all day. Like, who cares? <laughs> that's what I say. Who cares? And, and then I, I must say, you know, it's been a thrill talking to you, and American Pop is... is one of my two favorite uh, Ralph Bashi films. Uh, I think you wound up in, in the right one because if you were in Fritz the Cat, you'd have been an animal having sex with another animal. <laughs> and it, it just wouldn't have been good. So. Yeah. Uh, yeah. All right. Well, Ron, I want to thank you so much for spending some time with us tonight. I encourage all of our listeners to check out your new website. They can do so by going to ronthompsonactor.wordpress.com. 
Uh, and you have my phone number and all that good stuff. Keep in touch. We'd love to have you back on sometime. I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't hear the last part of what you said. I said you have my phone number and all that good stuff. So keep in touch. We'd love to have you back on sometime. I will. I will. And, and I, I appreciate it. There was really nothing going on with me this week. And then you called and... I said, oh, that's cool, yeah. Well, it, it was a big thrill for me because I, I saw a lot of your fans was saying he was going to tune in, and uh, at least one of your fans was familiar with us having heard other interviews on our show, so I was, wow. That was, made me happy, so, you know, there you go. Terrific, Craig. Thank you so much. Well, you, I, I, I enjoy talking to you. I, I, uh, I, I know Jesse. And he, Jesse Grant, he yes. said to tell you hello. Oh, he's yes, he's he the great. greatest guy. He really is. Really is the greatest yeah. guy. I, I, I just yeah. would love to see you two together at a bar. That's got to be great. We'll <laughs> yeah, have to do that cool. some night. <laughs> Thank uh, you so much. All right. Thank you so much. Stay, stay, You're both are really cool people. Thank you. Stay safe and have a great rest of your weekend. And stay away from all the crazies at the stores. What? I said stay safe and try to stay away from all the crazies at the stores. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I, was, I was at two, two grocery stores in the past two days, and they, they're empty. They're, they're, I mean, yeah. what if the people are crazy. I I mean, <laughs> they are. Well, when you do another movie, if you happen to do Cargo 2, tell them to fill that bitch with toilet paper. <laughs> because... <laughs> the, the, then you'd be a rich man. You would be a rich man today. Good, I, good idea. All right. All right. Thank you, Ron. Thank ha you. Have a great night. You too. All right. Bye-bye.